last week in a move that uh, President Joseph Robinette Biden II uh, declared was monumental. The uh, Drug Enforcement Administration announced plans to reclassify Mara Joanna uh, from the scary Schedule 1 of the Controlled Substances Act to the more uh, chill uh, Schedule 3, which is something libertarians have been screaming about for decades. Uh, Catherine, uh, you belong to a drug church. Um, can you describe using your grown-up words what exactly this means and what it doesn't? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, it's great. It's great news. Uh, like always, always give credit where credit is due. And this has been a, a long awaited step among many, many still uh, awaited steps in untangling the war on drugs and especially the war on marijuana. Um, but also um, bureaucracies are complex for a reason. And um, one way that you can think about the war on drugs is that um, it has built up around it this kind of incredible web, this network um, of rules and regulations and laws and penalties, and they exist at every level and across many agencies. And so rescheduling marijuana is one step that creates the conditions for creating the conditions for maybe at some point actually having a world where people could just smoke weed and be left alone. Um, we are not there yet. And I think, um, Nick, your interview with Kat Murdy, um, you talked about this with her a little bit, that there is now um, in some corners an impression which Biden and also Kamala Harris have worked to create that like we did it and we're done. Um, and pot is legal now on the federal level. And that is not right. Um, there is still much, much more damage to be undone, but a good step. At the same time, it is very different uh, than it was 10 or 20 years ago. You walk around Washington, D.C., you walk right outside of Reason's offices, and there are pot stores that you can just walk into, and you can buy edibles, and you can buy flowers, and you can buy stuff, and no one is being hassled, and there are not raids, and the stuff is being advertised quite openly in a way that really, really was not the case in 2005 when I moved to Washington, D.C. And it's not just Washington, D.C. It's uh, it's all over the country. I was uh, We were in Boston this weekend, but you drive around the suburbs of Boston, and you see uh, almost as many pot stores as you do liquor shops, which is really saying something because it's Boston. <laughs> uh, you know, by the same token, de uh, changing it from a Schedule One drug, which is you know is considered uh, by the government to have no known medical use and a high propensity for abuse, uh, to Schedule Three, which would put it in the same category as ketamine, uh, codeine, laced Tylenol, which is increasingly and sadly hard to get, uh, and um, uh, steroids, map. Um, so it doesn't make it legal. The main benefits to it is that it reduces taxes that are charged weirdly on schedule one drugs, even though they're illegal. Uh, and it would allow the Veterans Administration to actually prescribe marijuana within their facilities. And that would be, you know, that that those are good things. But this does not go far enough by any stretch of the imagination, even on Biden's own argument. Like he, you know, he said he was going to work to decriminalize marijuana and to expunge past criminal records. This doesn't do anything for that. And I think this is the time when you don't take half a loaf or the minute you take it, you gobble it down and then you, you ask for a full serving. Terrible metaphor, I apologize. This is especially bad you know, advice for edibles. <laughs> I know, and, and you know, it's like, I don't eat a lot of carbs anymore. I'm mostly ketogenic, so I just don't think in bread terms at all anymore. Um, but, um, you know, what should happen is that the, the federal government should deschedule, you know, full stop marijuana. They should take it out of the Controlled Substances Act, and it should be returned to the province of the states to figure out how they are going to deal with it. And the states are already dealing with this in a variety of ways. Um, and that gives us laboratories of experiments, uh, you know, it, it, or, you know, laboratories of democracy. And it gives us a range of things already happening. And it would allow for a much better economy, uh, you know, both a moral economy as well as an actual, you know, commodity uh, economy and things like marijuana. There's 250,000 people a year still or last year who got arrested for simple possession of marijuana. Um, that's, you know, a quarter of a million people are still getting hassled by this. Whether they go to jail or not is kind of beside the point. That shouldn't be happening. 
Um, and that's only happening because marijuana is still illegal at the federal level. Uh, and that should change and it should change quickly. Donald Trump back in 2016 said if Congress put a law on his uh, uh, desk uh, when he was president, you know, uh, saying turn all this back to the states, he would sign it. That should be the opening ante in 2020. And if, uh, you know, and if Donald Trump speaks at the Libertarian Convention, if Robert F. Kennedy who said he would do that, uh, speaks there, that should be a great question for them to answer. And somebody should talk to whoever is running Joe Biden right now and get him to start <laughs> talking that way too. It's phenomenally popular. It's phenomenally uh, popular. Anywhere between 75 to 90% of Americans are in favor of basic legal marijuana. Let's get on with it. Uh, I can see why Nick thinks of bread when the topic comes up, just because either way, right, you're baked. That's no. right. Yeah. I, I'm <laughs> rooting for, uh, for amphetamine to be descheduled, Pete. Pete. Pizza. Pete? See, I'm like, I'm, I'm uh, already get. I'm living in a world where amphetamines are. I'm the Iran I don't of this time. podcast. No <laughs> one know knows how to pronounce my name. <laughs> I don't have time for second syllables in a name. Uh, Catherine, what else? Build on Nick's uh, thing for a second. <laughs> what should we be pressuring uh, a president, uh, a federal government to do? What other things do we need to do to dismantle the the First, the war on marijuana, and then you can talk about other things, perhaps. But like, it's it's insufficient. So, what else needs to be done? Um, so, I think one thing is, uh, you know, the public broadly makes a distinction between um, simple possession and other marijuana-related crimes. Um, but uh, that distinction is not nearly as black and white as um, as many people would have it. And so, I think um, there has been some movement on this as well. Um, in the states, as well as uh, as well as in discussions at the federal level, but um, if you happen to own a gun and also have some weed, it's not simple possession anymore. If you happen to have a record and also have some weed, it's not simple simple possession anymore. Um, I would like to see some of those categories relaxed and expanded as well. Um, I'm not saying top libertarian priority is uh, you know free violent drug dealers but i do think that the the categories are not nice stoner dude who just wants to smoke in his basement and like sinister drug gang guys who want to kill you um and that is in the public imagination often kind of how these conversations go um so to to have a kind of more subtle appreciation of who exactly should be um eligible for pardon what crimes should be considered um, as we deprioritize um, enforcement on marijuana crimes. Pete, you live in uh, D.C. Uh, uh, in, Nick was talking about 75 to 90 percent of popularity of this. It's certainly I mean, the reason why we have as much uh, legal marijuana as we do, or at least state legal marijuana, is that uh, this stuff was voted in by majorities, uh, uh, you know, beginning medical in California in 1996 and then just going on uh, to general um, have you ever seen in D.C. Uh, a sense of, of national politician awareness on the Democratic side that, huh, this might be popular. I would like to win an election that I'm currently losing. Maybe I will be super legalizing marijuana. Is that something that seems to sink in ever on the national level? Well, the politicians who are most aware of this tend to be younger Democrats. And the younger Democrats in Congress aren't exactly the type of folks who can just say, I guess I'm going to legalize it. Because if you are a young Democrat in Congress, you're probably a backbencher. You don't have that power. And so you can do some tweets is what you can do. You can <laughs> maybe go on TikTok and say, you know, possibly we shouldn't be locking people up for this. But I, I do think there is this there is a, a real rhetorical move towards the idea that this that pot should be legal, that no one should go to jail for nonviolent use of, of, of pot. And I think we are we might be moving in the direction of 
well, if we're not going to lock people up for using it, maybe we shouldn't lock people up for selling it again, as long as it's nonviolent, you know, sort of basically non-disruptive to the social polity. And that's why we see pot shops all over in uh, in, in, in D.C. And even though, the, uh, you know, D.C. has uh, because of the, just the way the governance is structured here, Congress has some influence over the city's laws and Republicans in Congress have occasionally tried to sort of put blockages in the, the way of, of uh, pot legalization in the district. But there has just just been an absolute profusion in the past five or eight years of pot shops. And as far as I can tell, the pot shops, the ones that have signs and physical locations and hours posted and prices where you can just walk in and say, I'm, I want the 200 milligram brownie. That's what I'm going to buy today. And a guy hands it over, right? And it's just like that, that business seems to be safe and uh, and like non-disruptive and going well. There are several pot shops just a few blocks from where I live, and those are not creating problems in my neighborhood. Now, there are problems, I think, you know, with violence and with uh, street drug dealing in my neighborhood. And maybe, and this is actually the thing that I've been thinking about, especially with regards to D.C., uh, is that D.C. has had some issues with crime, with disorder, uh, with some of the, you know, with, with just sort of street level issues um, with with, uh, with crime and stuff. And I, I, I kind of think that if you want a world of legal pot, then you need to have, then like you have to accept that maybe, maybe we should be doing something about the people who are doing it, who are selling pot uh, just on the streets and are carrying guns and were, you know, and, and have violence associated with them. Because the, the pot shops that are across the street from Reason that are just down the street from my house, they're, they're not the problem at all. The problem are the people who are doing it outside of any sort of, um, you know, any sort of uh, kind of conventional retail system. We want, we've, we've always talked about, joked a little bit that we want heroin and vending machines, you know, here, but like the vending, nobody, nobody shoots each other over something that comes out of a vending machine, right? The point is it's easy. It's safe. It's like basic. It's kids get candy out of vending machines and it's a, <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe that went a little bit too far yeah. there. Um, but you see what I'm saying is like, is is the the issues in DC are not with the with people who are trying to do this in like a basic and normal way where they just want to have a transaction and sell a product. If you have issues, they are uh, the the folks who are operating outside of those systems, uh, and maybe we should be thinking a little bit more about that. But the thing no, we should uh, be thinking Corey, about that right is fixing the incentives that keep people on the street. So, and that's mostly at this point in say correct. California. Um, it's licensing and taxation. So that's a state level issue at this point. Um, and the more that there is breathing room given by the feds for states to um, institutionalize and uh, and figure out how to make laws around their own legal weed, the more that um, hopefully there will be incentives to reduce taxation rates, to ease up on the absolutely absurd licensing rules for opening, especially recreational shops. And those have, by the way, among other problems, uh, they have a terrible DEI problem at a bunch of places where you can only get your license to open your pot shop if you're in the right kind of um, protected class or are otherwise downtrodden. That's absurd. Um, so there, are, I think if if your concern is, hey, there's still dudes shooting each other over drug deals in my in my neighborhood, even though we have the legal pot shops, the clear solution there is. Uh, it's taxes and licensing, which is the most libertarian sentence you can imagine. And just very briefly, the, the operative historical metaphor here is very obviously prohibition. When you had prohibition in the United States, you had a lot of violence associated with the alcohol trade. That pretty much went away as soon as prohibition was lifted. Now, after prohibition was lifted, there was still a whole bunch of legal work to do at the state level because that was a, that only lifted the federal prohibition and many states still maintain pretty restrictive regimes. But lifting federal prohibition and allowing people to to sell alcohol legally in a bunch of normal retail venues was what removed the violence uh, from the alcohol trade. That was a clip from the latest episode of the Reason Roundtable. To watch another clip, click here. To watch the whole episode, click here. And make sure to subscribe to the Reason Roundtable. You'll be glad you did.